everybody. Um, hope everyone had a good Memorial Day weekend. Um, and I had a great, uh, great weekend. Spent a lot of time with the family, got some swimming in, had some people over. It was a very good time um, recovering. But over the weekend, <clears throat> oh, the video just went out. Now it's back. Over the weekend, um, I was asked uh, by a number of people to comment on uh, a a rally, I guess, uh, Trump attended a rally uh, where he commented on the uh, Ross Ulbricht case, or at least pardoning uh, Ross Ulbricht. I'll, I'll share that that clip here in a second, and I wanted to, to comment on it. Or I was asked to give a comment on it by a number of people, so I figured making a video would be easier than answering the same you know, five or ten questions over and over. So here, here's the video. A lot of booze. He was at the Libertarian National Convention. Thank you. Thank you. And if you vote for me on day one, I will commute the sentence of Ross Ulbricht to a sentence of time, sir. <laughs> I don't know if you can see. There's a lot of like. We can actually see it there, pretty good. <clears throat> Free Ross chance. He's already served eleven years. We're gonna get him home. We're gonna get him. Home. That is why I'm committing to you tonight that I will put a libertarian in my cabinet, and also libertarians in senior posts, combined with us in a partnership. We're asking that of the libertarians. We must work together. Combine with us. You have to combine with us. We cannot give crooked Joe Biden four more years. We cannot give crooked Joe Biden four more years. It's hysterical. Um, all right. So a few things to unpack there. Number one, I give him credit for going out, um, to what he had to have known was a, probably going to be a hostile crowd and, uh, and, and speaking a lot of booze there. So libertarians are, are pretty candid people with expressing their opinion. So, you know, that's their right to do it. Um, it's a little weird. You have someone speaking at the convention and you're booing them, but it is what it is. He knew going into that. I think adding more libertarians into his cabinet is a fantastic idea. Um, you know, I think there's uh, there's a lot of things to be excited about and agree with uh, 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 coming from the Libertarian Party and coming from Ron Paul, especially in light of what's happened over the last, you know, I don't know 15 or 20 years in terms of government and uh, government control and what happened during COVID and things like that. So those are all good things. As far as the comment about um, pardoning Ross, look, he's a politician. You know, he's a bit of a of a lunatic in his own right, even as far as politicians go. So who knows if he's serious about it? Um, I know that this is something that comes up often. Uh, this was actually contemplated by the current administration um, very heavily um, because on its face, when it's when the uh, argument for pardoning Ross is presented, it's often presented in what I consider a very misleading uh, comical way, which is, you know, here's a guy who built a website. And, uh, you know, how can we hold the someone who builds a website responsible for what the people on the website do, which, of course, is a very silly way of describing what occurred. It'd be like saying, you know, those who flew planes into the towers were merely pilots on a joyride in a plane. And how can they be responsible, you know, for the death of 3000 people? It was just a tragic accident that occurred after taking a couple of jetliners for a joyride. Um, it's a ridiculous argument, right? So this was contemplated in the current administration, and um, you know, of course, Department of Just Justice is going to weigh in anytime uh, they have a sitting president contemplating pardoning someone. Now, with that said, Trump is a uh, very different in a very different position. If he were to be reelected, I don't think Trump has a lot of faith in the DOJ, um, and I don't think he's going to give that the DOJ a lot of weight. Um, especially Southern District of New York, where this case was prosecuted. So that actually bodes very, very well for for um, for Ross, in my opinion, because it's likely to have the adverse effect, in my opinion, that I think if they weigh in and say, don't release him, he's only going to want to release him more. 
So the question that I, that I'm asked, you know, is I mean, what are your thoughts and do you think he should be released? And it's a tough question for me to answer directly because the arguments in and around Ross's incarceration are um, paradoxical. They're, I get two types of arguments from people. I get, and these are for like the the true Ross believers, the Ross disciples. I get the um, one side says what he did should have never been illegal. Okay. And so therefore any incarceration, arrest, conviction is unjust. All right. That's one argument. And then simultaneously, I'll get the same argument from these people, um, which is, oh, by the way, he was also framed and set up and it was a vast conspiracy and he didn't do any of these things. The laptop was uh, planted. There was information planted on the laptop. He never wrote the journal. He never made those Bitcoin transactions. Someone else was running the site for a while. Um, there was all this government corruption. There was a, co a corrupt DEA agent, a corrupt secret service agent. And it's confusing for me because I'm like, whoa, 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 which is it? Is Ross a hero um, because he created a free market site that, in your opinion, is uh, should be completely legal? Uh, and there's nothing uh, morally uh, wrong with starting a site like this that brokers in, well, originally brokered, brokered in guns. They took guns off the site but narcotics um, and tools of assassins like anthrax and, and um, poisons, other poisons like that, uh, and murder for hire, which we'll talk about that in a second. If your philosophy is that a site like that should exist and that um, the government has no business regulating that, then that's a separate discussion and debate that I could, I guess I could have and lay out my thoughts on why that probably is not like a super great idea to, to be able to go that far down the, the libertarian um, rabbit hole. But if your argument, on the other hand, is that he was completely set up, well, then I feel bad for people that are rooting for him to be released based on that basis, because there is no doubt um, in any rational person's mind who actually either sat through the trial or saw the evidence firsthand um, that there is uh, no argument that he is not and was not the creator and sole operator of that site during the entire duration of its run. Um, and with that, he made the rules for the site for the criminal enterprise. And with that, he got a commission um, for every single sale of that. And um, I can go through, I was looking through uh, a tweet earlier today that kind of outlines, you know, why his incarceration was so unjust. And, you know, yeah, you know, still probably have it open somewhere. And like, you know, again, it talks about, <clears throat> let's see. Uh, okay, so experts worried this precedent would discourage the next eBay, Craigslist, or Amazon. So they start with this preposterous argument that their lawyers um, fronted at trial uh, and their, his family fronts constantly, which is if Ross is convicted, it's going to have this chilling effect on – free markets and the next Amazon or next Craigslist as if the notion that creating a website that brokered in um, illegal narcotics was be legal before this. And now suddenly this precedent would be established and everyone who's running a drug site would be like, Oh man, now we can't run a drug site. This is, this is no different than running a drug business out of your home. Are uh, you doing it online? is not some sort of, uh, you know, out or legal loophole to say, well, it's online. And so therefore the next Amazon won't come along. Well, no, if Amazon started selling heroin tomorrow, Amazon would get shut down just the same as Silk Road got shut down. There was no chilling effect. Sur surprisingly, shockingly, there was no chilling effect. And any expert who thought that this precedent of convicting someone for selling drugs online would somehow impact the next eBay or Craigslist of the world is ridiculous. Why? Because it's one thing if someone opens up a site like eBay and every once in a while somebody sells something illegal on eBay, there's a difference between that happening anomalously, right? Every once in a blue moon and that being the entire fucking purpose of the site. Amazon's entire purpose isn't to sell heroin or sell guns or sell anthrax. The Silk Road's entire purpose, the entire purpose of the site was to sell narcotics primarily illegal narcotics. Now we can argue whether they should be legal or not, but that's not the debate. The debate is, would this establish some sort of precedent and have some chilling effect on the rest of the, of the 
you know, digital world that suddenly people would be afraid to start a website. When Craigslist got in trouble because people were going there for uh, brokering, pr you know, prostitutes, there was law enforcement action because it there was a tipping point where the purpose of Craigslist, Craigslist to buy some old treadmill that your wife never uses suddenly became uh, a hotbed for people look, going there to look for some hanky cranky um, that became the primary purpose of the site, or at least arguably one of the primary purposes of the site and law enforcement got involved. So it's as simple as that. There was no chilling effect. And yet this is, this is something that was mentioned on a thread that I read today about sort of the injustice behind this conviction. It's preposterous. Um, he mentions a double life sentence plus 40 years. The prosecutors do the book at Ross. Another misconception, the prosecutors do not determine the sentence. The judge does, right? The government merely lays out the case, lays out the charges, which must be proven beyond a reasonable doubt. And if proven, proven if the jury decides that those are proven, then the judge um, in the federal, in federal court system has to essentially apply a, a slide rule uh, to that to say, well, these are the convictions and what are the federal guidelines for that? Prosecutor doesn't have much say in that, um, if at all. And so um, when you added up all of the counts, the, you know, uh, dozen counts or so he was convicted of, and then the volume of narcotics that were sold, the slide rule can only go so high, right? And this is something that is a benefit and drawback for anyone participating in criminal activity online is that it scales so much faster than it could in real life. Like where Silk Road was headed was where it might've taken someone like Pablo Escobar five or six or seven years to get, or 10 years to get. And Ross was able to scale that digitally in two years. Why? Because it's the internet, because everything on the internet scales uh, exponentially faster than it does in real life, because you're, you're reducing, you're eliminating so many points of friction um, that you that can't exist if you're building a brick and mortar drug lab or drug factory in the middle of Costa Rica. Um, there's some limitations to how that's going to go, and there's going to be some logistical issues you're going to have to deal with. Of course, Bitcoin um, uh, contributing to that or alleviating a lot of that pressure that you have in an in internet of money that was invented in the few years, two years prior, three years prior to the to the advent of Silk Road also allowed this to be possible and allowed it to scale a lot faster. So again, what I find interesting about this case, and I have yet to find anyone who's um, discussed this part of it, which is the argument, in my opinion, the debate, in my opinion, should be centered around, is there a difference? Should there be a difference between people who commit a violation IRL in real life, right? And this, this point somewhat came up at trial. Um, or um, is, is it the same? If you do something digitally and you do something IRL, is it the same? And here's a, here's a very easy example to wrap, wrap your mind around, um, distribution of child pornography, right? Distribution of child pornography, or let's say copyright violations related to, you know, uh, music, right? If, uh, when copyright laws were written to protect the motion picture association and recording industry association of America, they were based, they were originally written pre-internet. So you have laws that say, hey, let's say for every copy of, you know, uh, a too short that you that you rip, right? You get a tape, you get a Cypress Hill tape and you dupe it. And now for every time you dupe it, there's like X amount of fines or criminal liability that can be attached to that. Um, OK, that makes sense. You have a guy in his house and he's got a tape recording unit and he dupes 100 tapes and now he sells them. And here's what his fine looks like. Here's what his criminal exposure looks like. But what happens now when the internet comes along and instead of that taking that person, let's say three months to dupe, you know, a hundred tapes or a thousand tapes or whatever, he can duplicate that same amount in three seconds. And not only could he duplicate it in three seconds, he can distribute it across the planet in five seconds. So now you pull out this law that says, here's what the violation, here's what, what you did and what time you serve. And it doesn't really make much sense because it happened. He went from no time to life sentence in a fraction of a second, given the um, giving the aggregate aggregating aggravating factor um, that is the internet. Meaning the internet is able to exacerbate. The internet is able to scale it so much faster that the person who maybe would have stopped at one tape or two tapes or three tapes ends up 
going from one tape to a 3,000 tapes in a fraction of a second, and now they're looking at $8 billion in fines, right? This is why when the Motion Picture Association and recording industry went after, remember in the early days of, of Napster, um, they were going after civilians, and they quickly realized this is not going to work because you're taking like a grandmother or some kid um, uh, you know, who's 15 years old who shared you know, a, a Miley Cyrus album a thousand times and they're looking at these insane fines and potential criminal liability. And you're like, how do we resolve this? Like this person just downloaded an album, left it sharing for a month. And then they calculated that it was shared a thousand times, a million times, whatever. It doesn't make any sense. So to me, that's where the interesting argument is. Same thing where people, I mentioned distribution of child pornography, right? There's, there are people back in the, you know, in the day, right. That when child pornography was distributed, it was, it was like Polaroids. Right. That's what the FBI would investigate is people distributing hard copy Polaroids, things like that. Well, when someone gets caught with child pornography back then, right, they might have 10 pictures or 100 pictures. When I did arrests and we found child pornography, if I found less than 4000 illicit images, it was a shock because it's it's a it's a fucking buffet out there. It's a feeding frenzy. So once these people get to these markets where they want to down, download child pornography, they could download one download one RAR file, one zip file that contains 32 gigs of child pornography. And now they're looking at 400 years in prison, let's say. So the ar the question is, the argument in my mind, the interesting argument that hasn't been had that I'm waiting for it to happen is do we need a separate set of laws that's a there's things called aggr aggravating factors and mitigating factors when you're considering sentencing? And is there should there be an argument that having committed certain crimes on the Internet, although transcendent to real life, they do have real life effects. People still overdose. People still die. People can still get poisoned, et cetera, et cetera. Is there a mitigating factor, at least in this transitional period we are as a as a society as a species is there a mitigating factor to consider that our brains have especially you know 10 20 years ago have not been adjusted to that yet and so we're still playing with the old rules with the old punishment with a new set of rules that that are not compatible necessarily because we're we're we went from you know muskets to you know nuclear weapons overnight and now the the bullet that's you know can kill one can kill a thousand and people are still carrying it around so i think that's kind of you know where people don't understand about the sentence it, it's seeming so harsh it's the same reason why judge Forrest's logic right at the sentencing and it, it was very sound and i encourage you to read it um her her sentencing i was there live so it, just so so people understand my context for how i know what i know about this is this was my squad that investigated. I got transferred from the Colombo squad, um, Italian organized crime squad to the cyber squad back in 2012 ish agents on my squad, three, two agents and one computer scientist in particular were already investigating Silk road. I was still wrapping my mind around how to investigate this new violation. Cause I went over from something in a lot of ways that was very, very different. And when the case was taken down by these agents, they pretty shortly after the case came down, left to go back to private sector and started the, started their private sector careers, um, or some of them might have returned, I forget. And then the case still has to go through trial. And a lot of people forget like that the arrest, that's like a big chapter, but that's certainly not the end of the book. There is still, oh, we have to actually prove this in court to 12 people who honestly, no matter, and we're talking about it in, in, in Manhattan, um, you know, no matter where you'd prosecute a case like this, explaining how the internet worked to a random jury, even today would be difficult. Just to explain how the internet operates and not have it be magic would be difficult. Explaining how Tor works, um, how the how the dark web works, how Bitcoin works, how decentralized currency like Bitcoin works, how the blockchain works, how forensic analysis operates, how we can prove that uh, a file taking off of a laptop on date A is the same file that we're showing you on date B a year later. Those are really challenging things, again, in the infancy of what we're talking about as a species of going from moving away from the uh, the importance of traditional forensics, you know, blood spatter analysis, DNA, which is still important, of course. But when you're talking about a case that highly 
it depends on digital evidence. Having to explain that to a jury is exactly like back in the day explaining DNA 30 years ago to a jury and or fingerprinting 50 years ago to a jury and have them understand, you know, this isn't magic. This is science. And so um, when that when those agents left and I became the trial agent for that, that meant that my job was to work with Southern District, who was prosecuting the case to make sure that not only did they have all the evidence that we had seized, um, but they had the evidence in the right way that they can consume it in the right format that they can consume it. And then to work with them to identify weaknesses in the case and say, all right, well, we're short on a witness who can, um, for example, when we went out to go find a witness who actually knew Ross's identity in real life and also knew Ross's identity online, which is an important thing when you're explaining to a jury who might not be able to reconcile those two personalities those two differences is that you have a witness uh, and we were able to find a witness that he, um, I don't want to say confessed to, he confided in that he was running this site, logged into the site, showed him how it ran and asked for assistance on running the website because Ross had some serious deficiencies when it came to security of his site, which ultimately led to those murder for hires, which, which I could talk about um, in a minute, but bottom line was, so that was my role. So that meant, having access to all of that information, right? Having um, access to all the things that we seized from the laptop, the passports, the diary, the chats. He saved every chat communication that he had with anyone uh, virtually, as far as we could tell. Um, I mean, just thousands and thousands of chats that, that were shit saved. His journal, all of that stuff, his voice, his, his, his calls, right? His prison calls, right? I don't know how many prison calls I listened to. Uh, when he was when he was locked up, right? So it gives you a very complete picture of, you know, what the universe is of the evidence that exists. And then you work with Southern District to say, you know, what is the theory going forward for how this is going to be prosecuted? And how can we get this evidence in, in a consumable way that a jury would understand that would lead to, you know, ultimately a, con a conviction. So that's my frame of reference where I come from. So when I read threads about things like, oh, there was, um, you know, the, that same thread I was referencing, the guy talks about um, the server that was seized. I think this was the Icelandic server and how Ross was not permitted to um, like suppress the server, was not permitted to uh, keep that evidence out. Well, the reason for that was because Ross had put himself in a trick box by denying that he was the person responsible for setting up that server and configuring that server and owning that server. And we knew it was him because um, a lot of that stuff was registered using fictitious aliases that we found then on his laptop um, as some of the evidence. But once you deny that you own something legally, you lose what's called standing. So, so what standing is, is that in order for you to make a motion to suppress evidence, you have to show an ownership interest, a privacy interest in that, object, that item, that thing in order for the court to consider it, because I can't go and say, I want to move to suppress the introduction of a kilo of cocaine, but I have no ownership over it. It wasn't in my house. I have no standing to make that argument. Um, so he backed himself into a corner because he had to then acknowledge that he owned the server in order to assert a standing, uh, uh, an interest, a privacy interest in that in order to get it, to get it suppressed which I think would have failed anyway, which is what his lawyers realized and why the lawyers said, well, we'd rather not admit that you own the server or acknowledge a privacy interest and an ownership interest in it because then now we have to deal with that to the jury that you're, how do you say you own something? And if it doesn't get suppressed, now you have to eat it. So these are all legal tactical decisions that were made during the trial that lawyers like myself can dissect and take apart for people and explain but when you're looking at it from the outside and people write these articles, they just don't understand what they're talking about. They're talking about things that are uh, well-established legal um, rules of engagement for a trial that were done for what they believe were good reasons. Do I agree with 80% plus of the tactical decisions made by his lawyers? No, I don't. I, 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 as I was there every day. My, not only was it getting the, the case ready for trial, but once trial starts – you're there at the table. I'm there at the table with the prosecutors for the whatever it was, 10 days of the trial for the entire day. And then after the trial's over, you're back prepping witnesses and getting ready for the next day. Um, so you get to hear all this evidence as it comes out. And when people 
on Twitter or X jump in and out of transcripts or jump in and out of conversations. What I find is they're they're they they were weren't following it very closely or like watching a movie where you're watching three seconds of a movie and then going out and giving your opinion on what's going on in the scene or what that what the character's motivation would be in that scene or how this is going to play out. And you're like you watch three seconds of it. It's not possible to form an intelligent. Um, uh, opinion on something for having such limited exposure to it. Um, so all this evidence that, that came in throughout the trial, um, there was, they mentioned he didn't have an opportunity to cross examine witnesses. This is ridiculous. That's completely unconstitutional, right? These are things that are there that, that are the idea that you have a criminal defendant facing serious charges and they weren't allowed to cross examine witnesses was the cross examination of the witnesses effective. In my opinion, no, they were ridiculous arguments being made. The, 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 the defense's theory was right out of the gate in opening statements. He created the website, but he quickly gave it to somebody else. Who this person is, I don't know. We don't know. Maybe maybe we'll figure it out during the course of the trial. It just wasn't compelling. Um, from a technical perspective, when they attempted to cross-examine myself or other witnesses, they were just – they're just – there are lawyers that can be really good at cross examinations as it relates to a DV trial or even a murder trial, but it takes a special type of attorney with a special training, uh, technical training to understand how to cross examine technical witnesses. And in my opinion, it just, just was not there. There was just a lot of like surface level cross examination about what about this or that, which is easily answered. And then there's just no, there was just no depth to it beyond that. So, but he, they were permitted to cross examine, uh, every witness. They talk about people talk about how they weren't allowed to put on their own expert witnesses. Again, a misunderstanding of of the federal rules of criminal procedure, um, which is that the point of bringing in an expert witness there has you have to show to the judge that that witness is necessary to um, elucidate, to opine, to express um, thoughts on a subject that without that person the jury might be lost. So you can't just bring in an expert, for example, to talk about how a wheel is round. You don't need an expert to talk to a jury about how a wheel is round. You need an expert to talk into a, to a jury maybe about how a wheel is manufactured, how Michelin produces the rubber, how it molds the rubber, the differences in the ratings of the tires, right? A jury's not going to understand that. They're going to need a witness, an expert to come in and say, here are my qualifications. I'm, I'm a fucking wheel expert, and I'm going to talk to you about why, what a Z rating on a uh, a Corvette Z06 is why that's necessary and why you don't need a Z rating tire on a fucking Chevy Malibu. Um, and when we had put our witnesses on our expert witnesses, our technical witnesses to talk about blockchain transactions, to talk about digital forensics, how we image devices, how we hash those devices, how we can show that this is the same thing that was taken on that date is the same thing being shown now. Um, there, they wanted to put on a computer expert witness. And I remember this at trial it was frustrating because the judge gave um, Ross's attorneys multiple chances to show some cause of what is specifically is your witness going to add to this trial? What are they going to talk about? And his attorney just kept saying, eh, computer shit. He's going to talk about computer stuff. And then we get the CV um, of this witness and it's like laughable. I mean, this person had no business testifying in court about whatever it was they were even trying to get at, which made no sense. So, you know, this person who tweeted something about Andre Antonopoulos, who, who I'm a huge fan of, uh, I don't know what they, ex I never heard anything about this at the trial. They were like, he was willing to testify in his defense. Defense of what? His expertise would have been related to blockchain analysis. Um, they could have, if they were to dispute our analysis of what we saw happening on the blockchain as it related to wa the wallet recovered from Ross's laptop and the Icelandic server and the money flowing, the coin flowing back and forth between that server and his laptop. They could have done that either through cross-examination or put their own witness on. So I don't, again, I don't, I have no idea what people are talking about, about uh, these witnesses that supposedly were willing to come in. They would have absolutely been allowed to that. And I'll tell you my experience. I've been through many trials at the FBI. Um, the uh, criminal justice system is weighted towards uh, making sure that defendants have wide latitude during trial. I've been torn up on cross-examination on things that I know as a lawyer were completely 
inappropriate line of questions, completely irrelevant, completely beyond the scope of my direct examination, that the rules of, uh, of, the, of the court would absolutely say the textbook tells you this should not be permitted. And I've had judges on multiple occasions allow this to go on because they want to make sure that they're preserving for the record that this defendant had every opportunity to explore anything they wanted to within reason without wasting the court's time or wasting the jury's time because trials can't be six months long. This is the OJ trial. So, um, and lo and behold, after this conviction, Ross has been through every appeal process imaginable. He's exhausted every appeal imaginable, and there's been no overturn. There's been or no order for new trial. So I want people to understand in their mind, like if you're so convinced there was this like horrific misjustice, this horrific corruption that was occurring, um, how did it get through this entire appeal process? You're telling me there wasn't one, um, one judge in this entire process that wasn't corrupt? That didn't look at this and say, yeah, this is there was all sorts of rules of uh, criminal procedure violated here. There's all sorts of constitutional rights stepped on. There was 14th Amendment violations left and right, um, you know, uh, which, by the way, if you are prohibited or precluded from cross examining, that would be like on its face, instant appealable issue, uh, instant new trial. If you were prohibited from putting on a reasonable witness um, after showing cause as to why you needed that witness, that's instant appeal. So these are all things that are like, when you look at it from a defense attorney's perspective, as a trial is going on, half of the trial is about defending your client and half of the trial is about preserving the record for an appeal. And they tried left and right to do that and they failed miserably. Um, so again, reconcile that. Okay, everyone in the world is corrupt. Everyone's conspiring. It's the only solution in that, that even through the appeals process, um, that that there was no judge uh, involved in any of this that that was willing to um, stand up for the Constitution and uh, and 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 decide that that a new trial was warranted, um, you know, of course not. Um, so and then f finally, and I meant this to be like a five minute video, and of course I'm going off on a rant for 32 minutes. So um, and again, a, a, a thing the thing you know you hear often too about the. Um, the murder for, for hires that, that didn't happen because they weren't charged. So therefore, if they weren't charged, people who don't understand how uh, criminal court works and how prosecutions work would say, well, if it was, wasn't charged, it must be because it's not true. Well, no, um, when you're putting a case together and you're deciding what charges to bring, you must also consider the, um, again, length of the trial and whether those charges help or hurt your overall case. If the charges that you're already bringing, the core meat potatoes of the charges are regarding narcotics trafficking and conspiracy around narcotic, narcotics trafficking, which is what Ross's case was. There was like the, um, you know, like distribution of, of hacking tools or whatever. And those are like whatever, you know, whatever charges. But the core of it was obviously related to the narcotics. Um, adding in the murder for hire charges, which were very strong. But knowing full well that no one was ever actually murdered and that it was the government's belief that he was absolutely scammed, um, that he was tricked into paying $160,000 in Bitcoin at the time for like five murders, that anyone with any street smarts would read these transcripts and be like, he's absolutely being manipulated. And this was something wise guys did on the organized crime side all the time, right? They would target restaurant owners, business owners, and create a a piece of fiction around some threat or some violence that may happen and use that as the basis to get them to, let's say, pay for something to be done, either pay for protection, pay for someone to be murdered, et cetera, et cetera. And the entire thing is just fabricated. Ross was manipulated because his site um, was constantly being ha hacked. And this is documented in his own journal. This is documented in his spreadsheets that he kept. Um, documented in his one-on-one -on -one conversations with Variety Jones and other people he confided in about the site being hacked and how he was very much knew he was in over his head in terms of the security of the site because he wasn't, you know, this was all, first of all, uncharted territory for a lot of people generally, but this wasn't his, you know, this wasn't his training by trade. He was very smart. He is a very smart guy, but, you know, designing websites, secure websites on tour uh, was not like his forte. And so, um, and so, uh, because the site kept getting hacked, he kept finding himself in situations where people were writing him and saying, Hey, I know who hacked the site because a lot of these hacks were public to the users because money went missing, uh, or people were posting things about it in the forums that their site was hacked. So people were asking questions. Well, at one point he's manipulated because somebody says someone does hack the site, steals a bunch of user and vendor information, which is 
in his own words, you know, sort of the most important thing about the site was the anonymity it provided, the perceived anonymity, an anonymity provided. And then someone else contacted him claiming to be the Canadian chapter of the Hells Angels saying, hey, I know who stole this information. Would you like me to take care of it? And in his own saved chat logs, which were recovered from his computer that was in his fucking on his table with his fingerprints on it at the Glenmont Public Library in San Francisco on that laptop that he was actively using at that moment when it was taken away from him was where these chat logs, which were saved, where he goes down and basically weighs out the pros and cons of having these people murdered. And he ultimately decides that it's better to have these people murdered to protect the site than it is to have these people divulge this information. And I don't know what is so hard for people to believe or understand about the fact that anyone who goes down this road, I can't tell you how many wise guys I worked with either as I ran as sources or first arrested and prosecuted who started off with the best of intentions, who started off with ideas that was just a little bit of this and a little bit of that. And I don't know how I went here. And I think, you know, I think that's why Breaking Bad is probably my favorite even more than the Sopranos is probably my favorite show, right? Because I think no show captured the, that sentiment, that fact uh, better than breaking bad with Walter, the evolution of Walter White's character, which starts off as a guy who starts making crystal meth to set aside a little bit of a nest egg for his wife and kids. Cause he's been diagnosed with cancer and he just wants them to be okay when he dies, which everyone could relate to something like that. Maybe not crystal meth per se, but doing something. And by the end of the fucking show, spoiler alert, he's murdered like kids, adults, burned shit down. I mean, committed horrific crimes that the person at the end of that show wouldn't even recognize a person at the beginning of the show. And Walter White understands this finally at the end when he concedes to his wife after years of telling her, I did this for you, I did this for you, finally says, I did this for me. That's the realization of a human being that's introspective enough to realize that it may have started out as me doing this for you, but something happened along the way. The corruption, the power corrupted this person into becoming something that it became about them and about the ego and about the money. And um, that's where Ross ended up when the murders for hired happened. And had there not been intervention, had the site not been taken down, eventually Ross would have paid to have someone who was going to be murdered who actually would have fucking been murdered. And that's what I think people need to wrap their brains around when considering that. And I could prove to anyone seven ways to Sunday how we know 100% fact that that was Ross behind the keyboard sending those messages. It was Ross that transmitted um, those Bitcoin payments from the wallets that we recovered from his laptop that there were no other transactions on except for the ones that he was doing in relation to the site, it wasn't that while it was not co-accessed, those pro private keys were not shared with anybody. There was no other activity during, before, during, or after that. He was in exclusive control of those wallets where he sent those funds. And then back in his chats, which were saved under his screen name, there was confirmation from the bad guy that these murders were happening. So um, I'm happy to have that argument, but it's, it's sort of a waste of time. But if someone wants to have that, sure. But concede for the moment, consider for the moment, if that's true. If that's true, does that change your opinion of who he is and what happened? And that brings us back to the beginning, which is my thoughts on whether he should be released or not. I'm a big proponent of second chances for people. I have given second chances to mobsters who've murdered people that I think people would probably highly disagree with why those people are out or, or what they did. And this was after significant cooperation um, and, um, and most importantly, acknowledgement of what they did, everything they did, everything they did, right? When we cooperated wise guys, they didn't just say I committed two murders. We went down gruesome detail, went into the gruesome details, right? One, one witness I remember in particular was dancing around the issue that the person was essentially, um, uh, disfigured after being shot in the head, uh, having his uh, his dick chopped off and shoved in his mouth and then set on fire in like the middle of fucking Queens, right? Those details are important for us to know and they have to admit to those details. That's the first step to sort of rehabilitation and, uh, and, and, you know, being, being redeemable, I guess, as a human being, you have to acknowledge the fault dancing around it is all I've heard for the last whatever years, 12 years coming on 12 years. 
The most I've heard from, from Ross's camp is I made some mistakes, never acknowledging what specifically those mistakes were. Now, if you believe that running that site is legit, then I give him credit because he's standing by what he believes is right. And he shouldn't back away from that just for the sake of any, you know, pardon or whatever else. Right. But admitting that you were the sole operator of the site, admitting that it got out of control, admitting that you, it got to the point where you did order murder for hires and thank fucking God that you were just fooled and that you were scammed and sending that message out to people who have this idea that, Oh, we'll just open up a free marketplace and everything's going to be great. That in your experience, in your own personal experience, is a fucking lie because your own experiment went sideways on you within two years. Forget being arrested. Pretend that wasn't even a crime. The things that were happening on that site, like selling anthrax and arsenic and people bringing that to his attention saying, I don't know, should we take this listing down? It's like the number one tool of assassins and it does no harm. And his response being, well, this is the black market. Right. That sounds all cool. Like, oh, everything is free site that sells everything until your fifth grader is being gets fucking anthrax dumped in her Diet Coke during lunch and is murdered because some shit for brains ordered anthrax off of fucking Silk Road and got it to his house in two days. And you're like, eh, you know what? Okay, sarah, sarah. So think about that and think about what it means to to come out and say, hey, I fucked up. I deserve a second chance. You know, I may still believe in certain principles, but I, but I think we all agree that things got out of control. I haven't heard anything like that from him. Now, at first I thought it was because he was smart enough to know that he was going to exhaust all his appeals. Like at sentencing, right? Ross was like, what, two feet behind me. There was just nothing, but Hey, give me a chance to get out. You know, mistakes were made, nothing in knowledge. Okay. I understand that as a lawyer, I can appreciate the fact that you're not going to want to admit to anything in your sentencing that you may believe you have a viable appeal. All appeals have been uh, exhausted. There's nothing left. And I still haven't seen any sort of, um, you know, un acknowledgement or understanding. And I think at this point, he's so far down that path of denial about some of the awful things that happened that I think if he gets out, he's just going to continue to deny that. And it, it sickens me that the public, there's a big portion of the public that are going to be fooled into believing that because he's murdered for hires, were never charged, um, that they didn't happen. Um, because that there was no actual victims because they didn't actually ha happen, the murders for hire, it's like it didn't exist. Um, those charges were not included for specific reasons, which were it just didn't help our case. It com confused the case. It was we acknowledged right in our opening statements that those murders never happened. Um, but it was shown to the jury, as it is in every organized crime trial, that it shows control over the enterprise. Because if someone's in a position that they're murdering people to protect the criminal enterprise, that's really good evidence that they're in control of that enterprise. That's why that was shown to the jury. And that's why it was considered for the jury only in that context. And it was not considered to the jury or to the judge for sentencing. And Judge Forrest went out of her way to make sure that was clear. What was considered for sentencing was only the things he was convicted on. So this is normal, this is normal stuff. So and as far as what he could do, the timing of this all happening is interesting to me because something's going to be released in probably the next month or so um, by a major news organization about um, about another case I was involved in that uh, had a very different outcome that has some similarities to this. And um, when that does happen, and I want people to think about the two choices that the people involved um, – the choices that everybody made in, in that and, and which might be the better or which is the worse in your opinion or how it affects the outcome of it. Um, and, and I think it'll maybe add something to this overall conversation about, you know, what this sentence uh, looks like and why this sentence was so steep and what the outcome should be. So for me, my hope would be that do I think Ross should necessarily die in jail? No. I mean, there's a good argument, uh, you know, and I've thought about this, probably more than most, um, you know, I do believe in second chances. I believe that Ross's, um, what Ross was in real life, uh, was very different than what Ross was online. And again, for people that are new to crime that don't understand that that is actually very common for criminals. Um, people that I arrested that were, you know, on the administration level of the Colombo family, 
had family members that would swear up and down about what great people they were. So it is very possible and, and, and dare I say very common that criminals figure out ways to live two disparate lives. Um, and that one side is this person involved in criminal activity. And one side is, um, this person who wanted their face treats people very, very well, very, very well. I think Ross had, had, a, um, you know, did not have a history of, uh, treating people poorly or doing, you know, horrible things. And I think quite to the contrary, I think Ross is probably was a good person. I think, um, getting involved and in starting this site may have even started for sort of the right reasons, but it, until, in my opinion, until there's an acknowledgement of everything that happened and let's stop with the, I was framed and the tinfoil hat bullshit that just confuses the issue until um, that happens. Then in my mind, a person isn't worthy of a second chance because you can't, you can't just say, Oh, I did, I did some stuff and, uh, but I need a second chance without saying, what are your thoughts now? 12 years later on like what you did and what you might tell someone in your situation who's, getting involved in this, the pros and the cons morally and legally of what you're about to do and where it went sideways for you. And is there some takeaway from that? If it's just, ah, some mistakes were made and I may, I deserve a second chance. I'm not so sure. I think I could think of a hundred other people that deserve a second chance that have served a lot more time, um, who were convicted of a lot less, um, that, that, that deserve a second chance than, than someone who's going to sit there and play both sides of it and say, I'm not going to admit to what I did. Only the cool shit that makes me a hero and a legend. I'll admit to that stuff, but all the fucking horrifically awful things that happened. Oh, those were all conspiracies. I was set up for those things. Bullshit. So in, in for a penny and for a pound with that. So in my opinion, until that happens, I'm not really too keen on it. Um, whether it happens or not, um, you know, remains to be seen it's first Trump would have to be elected and then he'd have to actually follow through with this. Um, and, uh, you know, I really don't care in the end. It doesn't affect my, my day to day life, but, um, it is something that, um, uh, having the level of involvement that I had in it, uh, you know, it can be frustrating when you're reading people basing opinions on false information and, uh, and you know, for a fact that that's just, you know, just not true. So those are my overall thoughts. Um, and again, there is something happening probably in a month or so I can't talk about now that I think will be interesting, interesting and, and, um, for context purposes, but those are my thoughts in a nutshell. Sorry. I went rambling on uh, for 47 minutes and what I swore was going to be a five minute video, but there it is. And, oh, and my, uh, podcasting equipment cameras on the fritz, which is why I'm on this camera angle for this video, but I'll return to the old camera angle with no clutter uh, in the near future. So hope everyone's doing well and take care.